I gave him the guitar and I'm like, do your rock face and just did it like that, which is great. Um, you don't have that advantage with some of the people that you work with when you're taking photographs. Um, and you might want to bear in mind that some of them will need more direction than others. And more often than not, they'll, they'll need quite a lot. You point a camera at someone and most people just, okay, I'm going to do like this. Tell them what to do. Uh, you'll learn over time the more people you take photographs from the image. And more often than not with people, the only way you'll ever achieve that is by asking them for it. Um, so, I'm going to cover manual photography basics, and I talk a little bit about exposure, which you guys already you know. But, and, um, there are three factors to bear in mind when you, when you want to get a properly exposed photograph. And I'm going to ask these two guys here if you know what those three things are, and undoubtedly they will be able to walk on. Light. Okay. Yeah, light is, is right. It's not one of the ones that I've got, but it, it kind of is. So yes, yeah, light or let's say aperture. Yeah. Okay. Shutter speed. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And there's one more, which you might not have to consider so much because you publish you digital. Aperture you... Aperture. That was the first one that we got. Shutter speed was the second one. The third one, if, if no one knows it, it's, it's maybe one that you don't consider so much, but it's film speed. We will be doing. Um, so the ISO setting on your camera is how fast the sensor on your camera, or if you're using manual, you know, analog photography, how fast the film absorbs light. So aperture is is is, is the uh, the opening of your lens. The word aperture directly translates to opening, doesn't it? Okay. Um, and the wider the aperture, the more light gets into your into your camera. Weirdly, the numbers go the wrong way, don't they? Um, so the smaller the number, the wider the aperture. So everyone's looking for this new lens that's got an f1.0 or an f0.95 or whatever. Everyone gets excited about these lenses that let loads of light. And there's a good reason for that, is that you don't then have to compromise your photography by using external lighting. You can take a picture anywhere if you've got a wide aperture, because enough light gets in, even when it's dark, which is great. Shutter speed primarily is used to control a movement or lack of it. So if you want to convey movement in an image, use on the shutter speed. But if you want to catch someone in perfect detail without any blur, use the shorter shutter speed. Pretty simple. You'll probably notice if you, any of you have got, I'm sure everyone's got a phone with a camera on it. If you're taking pictures at night when it's dark, even when your phone uses its flash, if people in your picture are moving, they'll be a bit blurry, won't they? And that's just because your camera or your phone tells it itself, let's say, it tells itself that it has to keep the shutter open for longer to make sure that the picture is fully exposed and enough light gets onto the film from it's going to see all the detail. And last but not least is, is film speed that I was talking about before. Uh, the, uh, the only thing you really need to bear in mind with film speed is that the faster the film, the lower the quality. You lose sharpness, okay? You get more grain, particularly with analog film, the faster the speed, the more speckly and more grainy it looks. With digital photography these days, I mean, sometimes at ISO 6400, you probably don't see any grain because the sensor is such good quality. Um, but with that in mind, sometimes grain is desirable. Sometimes you want it to look like a vintage photograph, which means you crank the ISO right up to the top and you capitalise on that by having a grain. But it's all down to personal preference. I don't know if everyone's ever seen this before, but it's, it's the exposure triangle and it's just those, those three things. Feel free to write it down, but I'm going to show you an even easier to understand example in a second. But the one thing you need to bear in mind is that when you're taking a photograph, you really want optimum conditions for all three of those things. So you want a wide aperture, you want a good shutter speed to freeze motion, and you want a, a decent ISO setting so that you don't get any grain in your image. But if you want to alter any of those three things, you're never dealing with one of those aspects on its own. There's, they're always at the cost of the others. So if you want a wider aperture and there's not enough light, or you want a narrower aperture, you will have to adjust your shutter speed or your ISO accordingly to make sure that your exposure still stays so nice. I think the a more appropriate way to, to describe it is this, and I found this online yesterday. Imagine a window in a building with shutters. Okay, those shutters don't let any light in. Um, the aperture is the size of the window. Okay. The shutter yeah. speed is how long you leave the yeah. shutters open for. And the film speed is you inside wearing sunglasses. Now wearing sunglasses means you desensitise the light so you can't take in as much of the image as quickly as you'd like to. So when the blinds open, it takes you a while to adjust to what's actually going on outside the window because you're wearing shades. It takes a while for your eyes just to open up. Okay? There's a few choices you can do to make you be able to see clearer quicker. And those things are either leave the shutters open for longer, and if you do that, your eyes will eventually adjust. But things will be blurry. 
you could move out to get a bigger window. And obviously, as soon as you open bigger blinds, more light gets in, you can see quicker. But your other choice is to take your sunglasses off. And the taking your sunglasses off is the equivalent of changing your door speed, so you can see more light quicker. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah? Alright. This, when you shoot in manual, particularly, is the the be all and end all, you're making sure that your exposure is right. But you do have a choice on most digital cameras to shoot on priority mode, don't you? So you can shoot with, you can tell the camera what shutter speed you want to shoot at, and it'll set everything else accordingly. Or you can specify what aperture you want to shoot at, and it'll set everything else accordingly again. There's also a program mode, which you might want to experiment with, which is a direct correlation between aperture and shutter speed. And as you roll backwards and forwards, you can see both of those um, numbers changing. And you'll see that as you roll your shutter speed to a shorter, time, your aperture will have to open up in order to make, make more light get in and you take the flash and the close graph fast enough and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Alright. Anyone got any questions up to now? I was told you were going to be really chatty. Go on, Yasmin. If you've not got a question, it's not a problem, but I, you know, yeah. if anything crops up, don't hold back. Yeah, please do talk tonight, because now you can talk. Um, so composition, uh, I'm going to talk about the rule of thirds. Does anybody already know about the rule of thirds? Yeah? Do you want to tell me what you know about it? It's like where? Something fits into it, like something will fit into two of it, and then you leave that one blank. Kind of, yeah. It's all about threes, evidently, because it's called the rule of thirds. The secret is that you divide your image up. Can you, can everyone see that? Those lines are right. Okay. It's two horizontal lines and two vertical lines. You break your image up into nine pieces, okay? Thirds in both directions. Now, the trick is to try and get key elements in your photograph to fall on intersecting intersections, sorry, or horizontal or vertical lines. <coughs> Stuff that falls in between them, more often than not, doesn't, you know, doesn't catch your eye as much. It's something about the way humans work that somehow this division of a picture seems to make it more pleasing to the eye picture. And loads of studies have been done on it to why it happens, and there's no real evidence. It's just nicely proportioned. We're used to that way of doing things. So you can see on this one, um, the Post it now that I scribbled and took a photograph of myself in the mirror of yesterday falls on this horizontal line, but luckily it kind of sits on the intersection as well. The trigger finger and the camera sit on the other inter intersection, and the rest of the stuff is really of no consequence to that image, um, which is a good thing because it really all I really wanted you to see is this nerve and the camera. So I guess it's kind of doing its job there. Um, this image, a friend of mine and his twins, um, doesn't sit exactly to that rule. If we break this up again into um, you know, verticals and horizontals, everything kind of fits in between those lines, but somehow it still kind of looks all right. Um, the last group that was in this room asked me how I could have made this image fit more into the rule of thirds if I'd planned it out more. I took this when I was beginning of talking, I didn't really take that into consideration, but I guess that if I'd given more room at top and bottom, then these things could have moved up or down and sat on intersecting lines. But if I'm completely honest, I don't think it really makes a difference. It still looks all right as an image. There are things that I've pulled out from this image that really niggle me out. This, pain in the heart. I should really Photoshop it out, but I, they already had it printed on the canvas by the time I, I realised I wanted to do that. And I don't know if the light's good enough in here, but you've got a bit there in it. Um, and I think it makes a difference. The little details and things that people will pull you up on in your photography, and if I'd taken this care and attention to think about those things whilst I was composing this shot, I would have asked him to change it to a different t shirt. Probably would have got some clippers and got your neck sorted out. It's only a two minute job, but it would have made a whole difference. And I might flatten that down. Although it's kind of cute, isn't it? That little bit of hair sticking up, so I don't know. Maybe keep that. Um, so, yeah, composition is really important. In fact, at the other end of the scale, if, if, you, if you use the rule of thirds, then people feel comfortable looking at that image because it, that's how it works. But if you choose to go the other way and avoid that rule, you can take photographs that make, make people feel awkward, which in certain instances might be useful. It all depends on what you're trying to convey. You know, your project might be that you want to talk about um, an event happening where everyone's unhappy and stuff like that, and so, so maybe something bad happened, then compose those shots awkwardly as well because that's what you're trying to convey to people. It goes well with the text that you write and all that kind of stuff, then you know, avoid that rule. I, I guess the, the real point is that it's, it really is up to you. But the more you think about it before you take your photograph, the better. Lines. Oh, I'll talk about them now. I can't complain this is my photo. This is by a very famous photographer called Henry Cartier-Bresson, who is probably 
one of the you know the most highly regarded photographers ever to have existed. If you Google image search for his name, Henry with an I, Cartier is in the watch and rest of the PR with less on end. Every picture that comes up is amazing. Every single one of them is in some way emotive or makes you, you know, feel a certain way. Um, and for the ones that don't make you feel a certain way, you're still sitting with them and looking at how well composed they are. This one, for instance, I mean, the use of lines in this is what I wanted to talk about. You can probably see that um, every line, this banister, this banister, this line, every one of them draws you to look at the subject, which is this guy on the bike. And you said to your mates, I'm going to go out and take a photograph down the flight stairs of somebody riding a bike. You probably think, nah, it doesn't sound like a very interesting photograph, but I, I think that, even though that's the content of the photo, steps and the bike, is actually nice to look at. He's left the shutter open long enough for you to create movement, which in this case, the bike is really important. But he's also shot this probably on a tripod to make sure that the rest of it, even though it's using a long exposure, is still pin sharp. Anyone got any comments on that? Who feel the same way about it as me, or some people not think it's so good? Rob, what do you think? It's alright. It's alright? I think it's alright. Right. Mm. Right. I think you might change your mind when you take more photos. But that's all down to personal preferences, isn't it? Alright, this is one of mine. Another example of lines, okay? In this instance, uh, Dodge and Cabana spent around 45, 50 grand on their advertising campaign, which is a lot of money, even by their standards, okay? And they wanted to see that their high street panels in London we're getting the job done, that people were seeing them, that there was plenty of traffic going past them, and this is what we had to do. So this photograph, I think, every line on it points at the advert, but at the same time you can still see that there are at least two buses with people on them passing by, which you know is, is evident that you know the advertisement's gonna get seen by lots of people and their money is well spent. Lines play a big part in, in photography. Not always, because not every photograph has lines in it, but when it does, and you see that there are lines in your photograph, capitalise on them. Because they can create depth, they can create the all sorts of emotions and drive your ideas to journalism like that. Right. With the guy on the bike and the bus in the last photo for that matter, the longer shutter speed was used, alright? And the same thing with this. Um, this is maybe a fifteenth of a second, it's just a backyard photograph, but it looks nice and it kind of captures the moment. They actually look like they're going to tear each other to pieces, but they were just playing the moment. So this was a panning shot, which is you know something that gets used a lot when people are doing sports photography and stuff like that. What you what you're hoping to achieve is that you should just be is going to be long enough so that you get movement in parts of your subject, person, bike rider, dog, but that you're moving at a, a consistent speed so that when you actually take your picture, most of these subjects is still nice and sharp. But the bits that are moving, in this case, legs and stuff like that, and maybe the tail, uh, uh, showing you enough movement. Yeah. And it's that kind of way between the two that you're trying to capture. It takes a lot of practice, and this is probably one of 20 photographs that I took that day of all of the dogs doing the same thing. And it's the one that came out. That's the wonder of digital photography, isn't it? That you can take as many photographs as you like, check through your image review as many times you know, as it takes, and that one photo is the one that you exhibit, and the people think, you know, it's good, or that you think it's good. Any questions at this point? You chatty lot. Yes. So if it's like, would that have a like short, um, shot of being Um, it's not like sport and rather like, like something fashion, but it opens like really fast. It depends. No, no, you're absolutely right. It depends on what you want to achieve. Okay. For instance, with football, they want. A moment in time, they don't, don't they? They want the two footballs in the air and the ball to be not moving, and you to see every possible detail of where they're going and the strain and the muscles and the sweat and all that kind of stuff. They do that a lot with boxing, don't they? They take photographs of people with their faces swinging off to one side, and you see every droplet of sweat falling off them, but it's a perfectly frozen time, right? Yes, you would use a very short shutter speed to achieve that look, but. If you want to convey movement, and in this case you do, you leave your shutter open for longer. And the reason you do that so that you get some blur in your photograph. Is that is that is that fair? Um, same thing. All right, it's another one of mine. This is um, Edinburgh. Sky booked another advertising campaign. It's quite a lot of money, 
and as you can probably see, hopefully, in the photograph, is that you can see the same creative on a number of bus shelters going down the road. And there's a few things that came into play on this one to make sure that the photograph was taken properly and that they did the job. One is the long shot speed to make sure that you've got the movement of the people. The second one is this is probably a composite, so two or three photographs laid together to make sure that there are lots of people in the photo. Sometimes we can do that. It's kind of cheating, but you know, all of those people were there at some point, so we can get away with that. Um, but the other thing that we take into consideration is is aperture, and in this case, it's not a wide aperture; it's a narrow aperture. And the reason we did that is that when you use a narrow aperture, you get more depth of field. More often than not, when you see photographs of people in fashion and stuff like that, they'll be nice and sharp, but then the background's all blurry, bouquet, and all that. You know, it's, it's nice and soft to look at. That's done with shallow depth of field, and that's with a, a wide aperture. The opposite of that gives you disaffect. Everything's in focus. You advert here, you advert here, this advert is in the background. Most of the people are in focus, albeit blurry because of movement. So that gives you the detail all the way through the photo. The opposite of that is if we used a wide aperture, this photo would be in focus, as would he, but the rest of this stuff behind would kind of be a blurry mess and you wouldn't be able to tell where you were. You certainly wouldn't be able to see that these other creatives were the same as the other that you looked originally. Yeah? Any questions on that one in particular? No? Perspective. All right, there's this is an interesting one. This is the one that I really do want you to think about. There's, there's a number of things to cover about perspective. I mean, we all learn at school to do the vanishing point thing, just like this, when you use a ruler to draw lines and stuff. Um, but in photography, perspective is used for something very different. It's used to, to create mood, or to convey in some way, uh, particularly with people or objects, a sense of big or small, depending on which way you're looking at them. All right? Now, this is a building in Manchester. I don't even know what it is. I took it on the way back from a party one night, back to the train station the next morning, and I just happened to look up and take it. Good man, perfect. You know, the sky looks nice. The building's really well lit. This is all natural light, no flashes or anything like that. It's just a taking in the street shot. But the angle that it's taken from, down below and relatively close, looking up at it, somehow makes it feel quite overbearing and intimidating. Do people agree with that? It looks like quite an intimidating building. Think about it right now, you probably wouldn't want to go inside because you don't know what's in there. However, it's a nice building, and if I are taking this photograph from across the road, straight on, it just looks like a good piece of architecture. Now, perspective in this instance has made a lot of difference to the way you feel about this subject. Looking up at stuff. Because of the way humans into Sorry, what? Is it like black and You know what? I think probably that would make a difference as well. If it was colour, it wouldn't look good, because it's a red brick building. It probably wouldn't look as intimidating, but the fact that it's really dark and moody and stuff makes a difference. But in this instance, we're talking about perspective. Um, as, as people, from day to day, we meet other people, all right? And if you're constantly looking up at people, everybody's bigger than you, everyone's a bit stronger than you, you may be feeling intimidated by those people because of their stature, all right, or size. And that goes for anyone. If I meet someone who's taller than me, which is rare, I do feel a bit, whoa, you know, you're massive, all right? And the same goes through the way around. You're looking down at someone, they look little, cute, and easy to deal with, all right? And in this instance, that photograph was taken like that, you know, literally looking down at someone, and they couldn't have looked smaller, all right? It also makes, that angle makes the heads look bigger, and the rest of the body looks smaller, which is what babies are like. When babies are born, their heads are big, their bodies are smaller, and it makes them, you know, less threatening, all right? Um, now, when you're taking pictures of men and women, or your peers, or the people that you might be dealing with when you're taking photographs for your projects. Bear this rule in mind. If you're taking pictures of guys, and you want them to look physically imposing, stronger, more masculine, either take them eye level, or just down, all right? You should always be looking slightly down at you, because you want to give the impression that you're looking at a picture of a man who's taller than you, all right? Same goes for a woman. If you want to convey a woman being powerful, rich, masculine. However, do the same thing with the angle, all right? But the other way around, if you want a person in your photograph to look demure or you know, have a softer touch to them, then take the photograph from slightly above. Particularly with women, if you get them to drop their head over slightly and look out of the top of their eye socket, so through their eyebrows or whatever, 
It's a really alluring look. It can help you a lot when you're taking photographs of women making them look pretty, right? So the opposite for guys, unless you want a guy to look pretty in the mirror. <laughs> Which, and in some instances, you might. Every project's different, isn't it? So, you know, you have to bear that in mind. Gay boy. In case, yeah. yeah. So moving on to lighting, and this is, I mean, this is the first thing that came up when I was talking about secrets to exposure. The lighting is, it really is a minefield. There are so many things that you can bear in mind. And there are two or three main choices, aren't there? There's natural light, which at this time of year, not a lot of, unfortunately. There's artificial light, and artificial light can be broken into a number of things. Artificial light, more often than not, is the lights that you see in the room. But it's also flashes strokes, and external lighting of any other sort, all right? Now, you can use all of those for your advantage. I mean, that the picture of the building, um, the, in the overpowering building, the black building that we saw, that was taken in natural light. It just happens to be that the sun was in the right position to contrast all of those windows and reflect nicely and stuff, and it gave me that really stark difference between the black and the white in that picture. But if the sun had been in a different place, then maybe the whole face of the building would be lit differently, more clearly, and it wouldn't have looked the same. So, natural light can make a lot of difference. In fact, natural light when you're taking pictures of photographs, depending on the conditions above, clouds or clear sky, can make a lot of difference to how nice they look. Um, with this, there are two different types of types of light that photographers talk about. There's hard light and the soft light, okay? Hard light is a bare light source, so a bare bulb, like this, um, or, or the sun, or something of similar nature, okay? Now, hard light gives you a hard picture. It's a pretty easy equation, okay? Hard pictures are things like, they give you every detail, really sharp contrast and stuff like that. Um, and in the, in the instance of that building, although there are clouds in the sky, the sun wasn't covered. The sun was a bare bulb, and it gave me that sharp detail that, you know, that came out nicely in that picture. If it had been cloudy, you might not be able to have seen so much of the detail because soft light gives you a soft image. And you can use that for your advantage when you're taking pictures of photos of people again. Um, is that if you take a picture of uh, a guy, you might want every detail, you might want him to look rough and, you know, and show every detail. Particularly when you're taking pictures of old people, if you want to make them look even older, use hard light, you need to get to see every wrinkle in their face, every detail, every speck of food stuck in their teeth, all of that, all right? But at the other end of the spectrum, if you're taking, for, for instance, if you're doing fashion photography, you definitely don't want that. No one wants food stuck in their teeth or wrinkles in fashion photography, so you use soft light. And the way you, to, that you achieve soft light is by bringing clouds into the equation, all right? Now, but obviously, you can't make clouds, so you use diffusers. A uh, diffuser can be anything from a big umbrella that's um, semi-opaque, that light shines through, um, or reflectors. Like, you can use your flash to bounce off a wall, as long as it's white, or at least off-light. If you had a, a, a separate flash that you would mount on your camera, the ideal conditions in this room for taking that picture would be to bounce the... Yes? Would a softbox have softbox? Yeah, yeah, and softbox is a... Yeah, well, softbox is the same thing because um, it does the same job. It's just like using... It's a diffuser in the same way. You just... It's a, it's a semi-opaque thing that you shine light through. And the bigger the softbox, the softer the light. And the nearer the light is to your subject, the softer the light will become. So when you're doing fashion photography, you'll quite often see your subjects on the chair or laid on the bed or whatever they're doing. And the lights will be like crammed right in and your photographer's here. And he's framing up literally millimetres out of, you know, of, of closeness to these lights. So he's getting as close to your subjects as he can um, and the lights are close as possible and they're as diffused as possible. And it gives you a really soft, you know, warm look and no, no wrinkles, no, you know, no detail, anything like that. Um, just you know, something that you probably should bear in mind when you're doing these projects. Um, I'll talk about these photos of lighting for a bit. I'm quite a fan of off-camera lighting. Um, it's really fun because you can do all sorts of there's all sorts of effects that you can do. This is um, not very bright. We'll take some. Um, but Sam's bike's orange, and he's wearing orange laced shoes, and there are bits of black and white on his bike, and there are black and white scarf. So we use two off-camera flashes. Um, and they both have orange filters on them to add a bit more orange to the, to the image and stuff. But the reason that we lit it from the side was because it was night time. We wanted to catch all the detail of the spokes and stuff like that. If you lit it from the front, you would have ended up with a massive shadow of Sam, for one, behind, which wouldn't have been very attractive. Um, you would have had all the detail of the bike reflecting on the wall and stuff like that, and it just wouldn't have been nice. You're trying to look at a, a product or something like that. It wants to be lit, but you don't want any distractions, and that's the reason we lit it from the side. You'll also notice that we shot this from Floor level. He's actually on a like a brick 
elevation, but I was lucky enough that I could be, you know, really low down without having to crawl on the floor, which also gives you that kind of, you know, overbearing look, and the bike looks massive and, you know, kind of cool, that kind of stuff. That's what we were hoping for anyway. Anyone got any questions about that? No? All right. This is the only photograph of me that I should speak for. This is one photograph, and this is one of the, the really fun things that you can do with off camera lighting. The great thing about using flashes is that it's very much a, a, a second in time, less than a millisecond in time. So even if people are moving about, still get that, that freeze. Now, the only way to achieve this is by me sitting in a chair in a very dark room with all the windows, you know, all the blinds shut or whatever, and the light off. And then we left the camera open for 15 seconds. And in those 15 seconds, we flashed with a, a handheld flash unit three times. So my friend Sam creep in and pop a light under my chin, which is why I'm lit from underneath, which gives you that kind of, you know, people on the torture position, you're all like, ooh, spooky. And I had that kind of effect to it. And then he went on the side, five seconds later, and did the same thing on both sides. And within that 15 second exposure, you end up with one picture. It's not Photoshop, they're not layered together or anything like that. It's just one in done in one exposure. But the great thing about working in the dark is that even when Sam had to walk in front of me, the camera wasn't taking any lighting, so it didn't interfere with the rest of the photograph. Does that make sense? There's a lot of fun looking at stuff like that. Well, we spent the same thing again with digital photography. This is one of maybe 50 images where we've spent all night in space with pizza and beer and something eventually we've got that one with the phone. All right, so emotion. Capturing emotion in photography is probably, in my opinion, the most difficult thing you'll ever come across. Because unlike every other aspect of photography, you can't control it. You can't make someone genuinely happy when you want to pull the trigger. You have to be there when it happens. Which is why I very rarely stumble across pictures of people looking genuinely happy or genuinely sad or scared or anything like that. Because they know you're there. Um, so the trick to catching emotion is being prepared. All right? so you turn up to an event like this. You know that when you take photographs of people, you don't want your shutter speed to be any longer than a 30th of a second because you want to freeze movement. You don't want to, put, you want to blur your ride. All right? So you set your shutter speed. And then you make, take some measurements, find out how much light there is in the general ambience of the, you know, of the environment. And you set your camera up ready to take this photo before you even get there. And then you try and be everywhere you can be for when that might happen. Now obviously you can make some anticipation of when moments like this might happen. This happened during a conversation with a family member. Of course she's going to be happy, just after she's got married. So capitalise on those moments and make sure that you're there when it's happening. The one thing I would say is that if you have access to telephoto or lenses, for this kind of photography, the further you are away from the subject, the less intrusive you are, and the less their emotional responses are going to be interrupted by your presence. But everyone feels a bit nervous when you come to me and you get a camera pointing in the face. I was lucky enough to be maybe 10 metres away with a slightly zoom with lens to take this picture, so I wasn't interrupted. But being there with 20 mil right in people's faces, immediately their reaction is going to change and you won't catch that. Truly emotional responses are gone in a second, so be ready. Even if you're not shooting at eye level, if you've got a pop out, you know, like a tilt shift screen or whatever on the bottom of your camera, if you can shoot at hip level, it's even less intrusive. You can probably catch people. You know. And if you can't see your monitor, sometimes just take those pictures even if you can't see your camera. Shoot from the hip. You've got a digital camera with a memory card, you can delete as many of those pictures as you like. If you shoot 20 on quick with down here, one of them might be nice, but you won't through the lens. Sometimes these things just happen. You let go now. All right. Any questions at this point? No. Nope. I will tell you, weddings are horrible. Yeah. <laughs> Wedding, weddings are nice, but taking photographs at weddings as a photographer, particularly if you're being paid for it, which at this point I wasn't, boy, there's no more pressure. Yeah. It is, what you have to bear in mind when you're taking photographs at a wedding is that you want to get one chance, and that they're going to have those photographs put in a book, yeah. and the bride's probably going to look at them every day for about two weeks after they get married. <laughs> and if they're rubbish, she will hate you more than anyone else. <laughs> so get it right, or just don't do it. If someone asks you to shoot a wedding, be confident you can do it right, or just say no. It's all right. Where's someone else? Right, location. Now this it ties back, actually. To Solmaz, this is where Solmaz got married. Um, the thing about location is, Every location is different, and everyone's opinion of that location is different. And now what we need to establish is 
who's the most important person when it comes to that location and whose opinion counts the most. When you find that out, then you need to ask them what their, you know, what their interpretation of the building is, what they, their interpretation of the location is, what they're trying to convey to people by choosing this location. Be it a big grand mansion in the middle of nowhere on acres of land, a beach, a nightclub, a lounge, you know, it could be anything. You need to find that out before you take your photograph and then you compose your photograph, light your photograph and choose your, all of your angles and stuff like that based on that interpretation of the building because you're trying to convey what they want not what you want as a photographer, it's more often than not you can be photographing for other people. So in, in the case of your projects, maybe interrogate your brief a bit more, find out what kind of things you're trying to convey from the, the photographs that you're taking and then plan that out. Now in this case, it's very structured. Some have wanted to, to have a venue that people felt was grand and the room was massive and that it conveyed kind of an opulence. Lots of money had been spent on this wedding, evidently. All right? By taking the photograph of this room with people in it, I did a job, I have pictures of this room with her walking down the aisle and all that kind of stuff, and they're nice, but they don't convey what she wanted to say about that building, all right? Having an empty room, when you walk into an empty room, it automatically feels bigger if there's no one in it, because your voice echoes and no one else is soaking up your mid to high frequencies when you're talking and all that kind of stuff. So that's why I took it in, a, in a, when it was empty. It's all set up, all the work's going in to make it looking beautiful, all the flowers on the chairs and stuff like that. And I shot it in black and white particularly because she wanted to create that kind of classic feel to it. There are colored versions, but they just don't seem to do it justice in the same way. Now I could have shot this if her, in, her interpretation of the building was different. She wanted it to feel all warm and friendly. I could have shot it from the corner looking across people's shoulders and shot it at the field. In that cookie angle, with loads of colour, oversaturated. There's lots of other ways to do it, but that, none of those things were, were what she wanted. So that's Does anybody want to ask anything about location? Just tell the story. I think you can. I think you can tell part of the story with a photograph. And in this case, this guy's been out there for a night and he's ready to leave a night club. Um, Maybe two or three photographs is enough for you to tell a whole story because for any story you need to start and middle and an end. And in this case, it's part of a, a, you know, a selection of photographs where I start taking people with pictures of people in the queue, lots of photographs of punters, including tattoos and all that kind of stuff, and then at the end of the night when everyone's off the bed, <coughs> a few pictures of people leaving, and that as a selection works really well. But I don't feel you can tell a story with one picture. I know that I think for you, your project you've got to take 10 photos, right? I think that's plenty for you to do a good job of, of telling what you want to tell about you know, the event, location, or place or person that you're you know, talking about in your film page spread or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, anybody want to ask anything about that? Not necessarily about that, but just about telling stories and photographs. Has anyone ever done that, spent a bit of time taking photographs, like if you started on Christmas morning, taking photographs of the presents under the tree, then taking photographs of the dinner, and taking <laughs> photographs of people falling asleep on the sofa. I think everyone does that at some point. That's something sort of in the photographs. You know, one like that, um, you know, I've seen that film Hango. Yeah. I've seen it anyway, look for all... Yeah, yeah. You know, like, it's on yeah, yeah, no, all the photos, it flips through it. It's a good parallel. Yeah. Start, uh, and they are in front of the color, aren't they? So yeah. you're reminded of what happened in the film, and you kind of relive that whole it's journey. Sure, it's an hilarious yeah. film and, and it makes it even more funny when you see things that you didn't see in photographs but you know where they happened because you see yeah. them before. It's a really good example, yeah, I like that. We could have done that in two or three photos, right? Yeah, yeah I think maybe it's 20, 25 or something like that. Enough to look great anyway. I'm good, thanks mate. And the last thing I want to say is that you should take your camera or your phone everywhere. The, um, the trick is having, having the, you know, being asked to get your phone out of your pocket and being bothered enough to capture interesting stuff. Interesting stuff happens to us all the time. That we see things, random things all the time. You know, and if you have a phone in your pocket, why not take a picture of it? Because sometimes those pictures are the best ones. All of these taken on an iPhone. Screaming cup of coffee, but within a couple of seconds that was, you know, it wasn't a screaming cup of coffee anymore, it was a half empty cup of coffee, but it's a nice picture, right? And if you probably get used for but it could even be used for, for advertising, you know, like a, a wake-up thing or something in the morning or something like that. Sometimes you stumble across an, an amusement arcade where some of the letters have dropped off and all of a sudden they become the Seaman Cafe, which are 
really a cop out, and then you laugh a lot, and then she's like, oh, no, no. and every person that I show that to is like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna drink there. Um, this, can anyone, I mean, just what does that look like to people? A person who laid down in some woods. Right, in some woods, yeah? No, it's no, a no. Barbie doll in some gravel. And sometimes you just stumble across this. To me, I mean, that's quite creepy, you know? It reminds me of, it makes me think of sexual predators and horrible stuff that happens in the world these days. And, and I can see your face screwing up there, but sometimes photographs are about creating that emotion. And that's what that does, right? Yeah. Not every photograph has to be about making you laugh or making you smile, like the picture of the glasses on, you know? Not every picture's about that, sometimes. And this doesn't adhere really, really, really to any rules, really, you know? It's just a picture of a broken doll. But it, you know, it, it could be used for something very interesting. And I have a bit of an obsession with uh, geometric patterns and stuff like that. So I have a tendency to, uh, I mean, literally at every opportunity, just shh, some files there, we'll look at a pattern in the newspaper or whatever. I've got a whole catalogue of photographs like that. This brings me on to another guy, another photographer that I'm, I'm quite interested in. I met him um, at a um, talk in Manchester recently um, called Lomo Kev. And he's, um, he's from Brighton. And uh, he started out taking photographs on a Lomo LCA, it's like an analog film camera made in Russia, um, cheap Minotaur plasticky kind of lens, which gives you this vignette kind of around the photographs, which is quite nice and warm, lovely looking. But he takes photographs of lots of things, but his obsession, like mine with geometric patterns, is full English breakfasts. And two or three of those photos together, it's just two or three photos of a full English breakfast, but when you go through Flickr pages, there's a hundred of them. All of a sudden, a 10 by 10 grid of full English breakfasts, mm. it's, a, it's a piece of art, you know? It's really interesting, there's loads of details in there for you to take in, and it provokes conversations, it makes you think about things. Every single one's got a different plate, different tablecloth, different cutlery, different food. Sometimes the things on stuff on a phone, it's like, oh, what's that on full English, you know? And it's just a really interesting thing to do. Bear that in mind, we've all got a phone in your pocket, it's all got cameras on it. Mm. Maybe build a catalogue of photographs of one thing that you're interested in. It doesn't matter. In fact, that brings me to another example that Lomo Kev got done. Someone noticed from The Guardian that he was taking photographs of full English breakfast. They also noticed on his website that he took a few photographs of people's wellies. I know this is quite So they set him a project in Hayden to go out and take lots and lots of photographs of people's wellies. And they were all taken from floor level with an SLR on and a film camera and stuff. And, um, and you never saw above the knee, really barely above the knee. You might see a bit of someone's skirt hanging down or whatever, but it was always, the focus was always on the boots and the floor. <clears throat> and they used it as a, as the, the illustrations or photographs that went with an article about going to the festivals in the summer, because the year that he did that article, or the photographs, all the festivals were really muddy, they all rained out and horrible and stuff. It was just an interesting take on how to convey, a, you know, a visual message about, about a place and a time and stuff like that. And those things, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing might be something you want to bear in mind. If you go to your location or your person or whatever it is that you're taking photographs of from your project, if there are consistencies that you see, there might be, might, everyone might be wearing headphones, might be loads of people wearing baseball caps or, you know, everyone's wearing a gold watch or whatever, then catalog them because they're the interesting things that you, you probably wouldn't write down, but you know it subconsciously. And if you bring that to people's attention, they'll go, oh yeah, I noticed that as well. There were loads of whatever. You know? It's an interesting way of putting things on. Don't get me wrong. You don't have to do that. You can do the opposite end of it and take a photograph of 10 completely different things. As long as there's some sort of continuity or coherence so that they all fit together nicely and you can explain that, then you probably still get a photograph. Um, Alright. So this is these are all the categories you've got to cover. Sorry. Well, you have to, I'm right, so you have to cover all of these, right? That'd be a long project. But you will pick one of these, right? And then talk about photography techniques that you might use in these arenas, photography arenas, let's say. So I'm just going to give you a bit of an insight into what I think would be the right techniques to use for certain aspects of this photography. Um, can I just ask the people who've already got SLRs, what do you use them for? What do you, what do you take pictures of? I'll start up here. Just flowers. flowers. Okay. Outdoors, and is it more close up stuff, or when you take photographs of flowers, you take a flower bed, or just individual colour? Alright, okay. So you've got a nice, relatively fast lens, probably above 100 mil, it's nice and shallow that could be up, so you don't get anything, you don't want to get distracted by the graph of underneath the flowers. Like Perfect sky, Alright, okay. I, I went through a phase, I, like, you know, the, um, the, I was talking about taking collections of photographs, I went through a phase of taking pictures of nothing but blue skies with one thing in it, so like an aeroplane 
or one cloud or a couple of clouds or whatever. And I've got a whole bank of those, which I keep promising to myself that I'm going to get printed and you know framed up with lots of images, spaced out quite nicely. In fact, you could probably run it chronologically and have you know morning sky, afternoon sky, daytime sky, whatever, and at any time. It would be quite nice. You do the same thing with your if you do some sets and some rises. There's a the whole timeline that you can do there. That's quite interesting. Isn't it? Um, oh, right, so you got the camera back. Yeah, 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 stuff? Anything interesting? Anything interesting? Yeah. Okay, what 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 do you find interesting? Oh. What kind of? All right, well let's talk about what the last maybe five or ten. Oh, well that's that's my kind of photography. All right, which means you've got to have your camera all the all the time. You never forget yeah, when you find something, right? Oh, good. Great. Anyone else? Are you guys in the front? No? No, that's what I'm going to say what they take pictures of. If anything interesting. No? Okay. Right. The reason I was asking is that there are certain aspects in these or certain parts of these that might fall into you know your your preference. Alright. Um, I'm guessing by the sounds of it that advertising, unless you're advertising flowers or sunsets, it probably won't. Okay. The thing about advertising photography, in fact we were looking through some magazines before and I'll probably talk through the same thing if I can find it. Nope. Did they go back? They well, I'm trying to find them. I don't know what it's going to be. Is it this one? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, great. All right, advertising photography. Um, more often than not, it's going to be about one or two things. It's either going to be your product, which in this case is the product I'll pass this around in a second, or it's going to be a person, a celebrity, or something like that who's endorsing said product. Yeah. All right? There are two different things you can do, obviously. For, uh, for taking photographs of people, uh, all the things that I talked about today, particularly uh, perspective and lighting and stuff like that, will come into play. Um, and, and maybe your location can reflect in turn on uh, how people would feel about the subject and the product and all that kind of stuff. But in this instance, the product here, I'm going to talk about how this was lit. Um, it's a dark bottle against a dark background, and if you could pass it on, that'd be great. The, uh, the downside of taking photographs of dark things against a dark background is that they don't stand out, you know, there's no separation between foreground, your subject, and the background. But what they've actually done here is that each one of those bottles is individually photographed and then it's photoshopped back together, and they've lit them from the side. So the same thing that we kind of did with the bike, where there's off-camera lighting, in this case probably soft light, so that you don't get too much, you know, glint on the bottle. And it gives you, shows you this, the edges of the bottle, which, you know, separates it from the background. So it can still be a dark bottle on a dark background, but it's, it still stands out, I think that's it. All right. Um, but the people, different things. Yeah. What, the last thing you want than that is a bottle with a shadow behind it, and it just looks all messy, you know. The focus wants to be purely on how nice the bottle looks and the, your thoughts of how you might feel tasting that, that drink. Yeah. Um, for promotional, there's a, I suppose, maybe when I'm talking about you might be promoting an event or something like that, there's a lot of photography gets done these days. Um, at night times in bars, so they're like, hey, look at all these people having a great time, yeah? Um, and, and those photographs are taken in a particular way in bars. More often than not, what they do is they'll, they'll use a flash, but they leave the shutter open a little bit longer, and the flash has been taken, and it does two things. Um, the flash reaches your subject, so you get to see every detail, so the girl in the nice dress and the guy in the nice jumper, or whatever. Um, but at the same time, if they continue moving after the flash is gone, um, you also get a bit of movement which makes you think, oh, it's a busy bar and everyone's moving about, it's really fun, right? Um, so that kind of thing is good for promotion. But there are other things that you can do, you might be promoting something completely different, it might be a flower show. And if, you, if it's a flower show, you need to bear in mind what people are interested in. They're interested in looking at, you know, the beauty and the detail and the colour of flowers, and your promotional photographer is going to be your picture, you know? Close-ups of flowers, maybe wider shots to show you the expanse of how much of that venue is filled with interesting things to look at. But a combination of those two would certainly do a good job. Right. Um, fashion photography is something that we see every day, isn't it? You know, we're bombarded with images of fashion photographers, and they all look relatively similar. Everyone's trying to be a bit cool these days by doing something different, and that's the right way to do it. But there are set things that have to be fashion photography. It's offline. Nice fashion, obviously, and more often than not, either a cool location or no location at all. And when I say no location at all, I mean high street studio photography, where the photographs are taken against an empty space, white background, dark background, just anything with no detail in it, so that your focus is primarily on the clothing or the fashion involved. Right? You might notice the lot of fashion photographs that you see in magazines, um, particularly when it's just a clean background with your 
person. Sometimes it kind of grades off at the bottom, so you'll have a really bright background and then it gets slightly darker at the bottom. So that's going to be done in two ways. One is either they have a big sheet of paper that the model stands on and it's actually printed and graded in. Um, or it can be done with lighting, and that lighting is pointed specifically at the background and not on the floor, so that you get that drop, and the light spreads out slowly and dissipates. Now, the advantage to do that is that if you get darker to the floor, it looks like your model, if it's all white, your model kind of looks like she's floating in, in space, so you can't the floor is the light, and you get sort of space. But that drop off in colour, so a darkness, or lightness, for that matter, gives you a floor for your model to be standing on. Does that make sense? It's all about putting your subject in, in the right space so that you understand what the perspective and how they fit into the scene. Um, photojournalism is completely different. Photojournalism is catching by catching emotion, which we were talking about before, or catching events, but more often than not, without the subject knowing you're doing it. Photojournalism or reportage, as they sometimes get called, is where you, you know, more often than not, you're sneaking up on someone, you're taking photographs of things happening without people knowing. Um, and the, the advantage of not being there with your subject is that you catch true emotional responses, or you catch things happening that you wouldn't catch if you were there with your camera in their face. Because there's no way that X celebrity is going to walk out of a hotel with Y celebrity, who's not really supposed to be with, but if you're outside of the camera. Whereas if you're 200 meters down the road, the telephone's on the lens, and you just say, good luck. There's nobody there who can mark you. Know, you know, you know, you know. That's my understanding of photojournalism. Yeah. It could be other stuff. I mean, you're telling a story. That's what you're doing too, isn't it? You know? And some other people know what you're doing. You can yeah. Portraiture. I think there's. Uh, there is a portrait just in face? Is it face to waist? Is it a full person? I think it's all of those, really. But the thing about portraiture is that. The whole point of the photograph is about the person that you're taking the picture, or the animal, you're taking the portrait of the dog, no matter. But it's about capturing every detail of that person's face and demeanor and stuff like that, and, and expressing through your image how you should feel about that person. So, again, perspective comes into that. Lighting plays a strong part because you can use hard light, you get hard edges, which in turn makes you think that maybe that person works outdoors or, you know, can't have some wash or whatever the result of that is. But at the other end, if you use soft light, then you can create a different image and a different feeling about that person. And when it comes to portraiture, it's all about that. It's about creating an image that makes the person looking at it feel a certain way about the person in the picture. Yeah? If you take pictures of yourself on Facebook, you want to look nice. Don't look rubbish. So you never, you never upload those pictures of yourself looking rubbish, but you might upload those pictures of your friends looking rubbish. Um, High Street Studio work is what I was talking about before. More often than not, this is a big white room with lots of big soft boxes we were talking about earlier that give you soft light and, and at the same time gives you really fast shutter speed, which means that your subjects can be running around the room and rolling about having fun with their family. But every picture that you take of them will be pin sharp. There'll be no blur, there'll be no you know, trails of their movement because you're shooting at probably, well, crossing the flashes is either 250 or 500 per second and in that time you can't move probably more than a million to you can sprint it so you know that's what's going to happen but more often than not high street studios are big empty spaces maybe with the odd prop to keep a baby interested or whatever but then more often than not they're big empty, empty white space and lots of light um, architectural is a different thing altogether. We use a completely different set of lenses, more often than not wide angle. Um, you'd probably be, if, if light's okay, you, you could shoot free angle. You, a lot of the time you'd be using a tripod and using a uh, narrow aperture. And the narrow aperture gives you the effect that we talked about on the photograph in Edinburgh where you've got lots of depth. You see every detail in the front of the building all the way through all the parts of the room and so all the way to the back. Anything you can see would be in focus. And that's desirable in architectural photography because you want to see the whole building. You don't want to see a bit of it and the rest of it blurred out. Unless I guess the focus of the photograph is just a detail, in which case you might. But then it's not really architectural photography, it's just a detail. Architecture is the whole thing. And medical photography, we were going to laugh about this earlier, but I mean, I, I don't know many people who do medical photography, but I would guess it's photographs of either medical instruments or you know, cuts and bruises, injuries, and all that kind of stuff. It's not very pretty to look at, but you think it needs to be documented just like anything else out there. And I think that what happens with those photographs more often than not is ring flashes get used because you're quite close to your subject, more often than not. Yeah, yeah. 30 centimetre 
area. Using the flash on top of your camera is just going to light the area outside that circle. So a ring flash draws light into every aspect of it. You don't get any shadows, you get to see every detail of said, you know, it wasn't a disease or whatever. Um, accurate So a ring flash is the closest stuff, but actually quite nice. Also a ring flash when you move portraiture, it can actually create, create quite a nice, um, what's called a catch light in people's eyes. You might see flashing photography sometimes with little circles in their eyes, and that's because the photography is a ring flash. You will have undoubtedly used that ring flash in conjunction with extra lighting to light the rest of your subject, otherwise you just went to a little face in the dark everywhere else, but it can create a nice effect. Um, illustration, I think, it's more about taking photographs of objects and small things and stuff like that, unless your illustration as a person we've already covered, right? But for other illustration photography, um, soft boxes are quite useful. And at the same time, you can also make a thing called a photo box. If you're taking a photograph, for instance, we take a picture of your pencil case. A flash on that is going to reflect off the plastic. It's not very pretty. You get a big shadow and stuff like that. You make a box, or you get a cardboard box, and trim all the, all the panels out of it, and just leave the structure in and then cover that in tracing paper and use external flashes outside, put your object inside. It gets lit nicely from all four sides, but it's soft light, so you don't get any shadows, you don't get any horrible reflections, and you get to see the object in its true selves. You know, it's, it's nicely detailed, but it's not, there's no glare on it or anything like that. It's a good idea for, to use that technique when you're doing illustration photography. I think fine art is probably predominantly black and white, more often than not, of either abstract stuff, or interesting scenes and stuff, things you don't see every day. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. That might be you. Cool. Um, <laughs> but I think the trick with fine art, at least in my opinion, is the majority of fine art photography is really, really high fidelity. It's shot on you know, either very expensive cameras or really slow film speeds, so you get every possible bit of detail in there. Um, but it's all about, it's not just about your subject. Well, it is about your subject, but it's not about the whole thing sometimes. It's be about it. We were talking about this before. You could take an interesting photograph from a good photographer, but share that. You know, if there's interesting detail to be seen, it's about spotting something that you won't see on every, in, in every day, you know, walking about. But if you pay attention to it, it can be interesting to look at. Yeah. I think that's what fine art photography is about. A documentary is the telling a story thing that we were talking about before, and I think this might be what a lot of you end up doing for your project, going somewhere, you know, a time and a place, and, you know, documenting what happens from start to finish, catching things that happen there, maybe, like I was saying, talking about commonality, see if there's people wearing, you know, similar clothing or anything like that, and if there's any continuity, then that's the kind of thing that you end up doing in documentary photography. Great. Right then, have you got any questions, because it's three minutes till lunch? Wow. So have you got any questions for Nigel? Really would appreciate it. You really you. would. I promise. And it's got a lot of effort into it. Like, what would you do like, like, to be the photo Well, I, okay, I'll tell you how I got into it. I kind of, I kind of fell into it, right? Um, I was, I was a salesperson for Clear Channel, the company that I work for, selling advertising, selling those bus to campaigns to people around here. This college, in fact, for one. Um, and it costs Clear Channel, the company, between five and eight hundred pounds a day. For a freelance photographer to go out and take on photographs of that quality, okay? And they decided that they didn't want to do that and they were going to give me a concession on my sales target so that I got one day a week where I'm out taking photographs. So you can stumble into it like I did. You can spend forever going to university and learning photography theory and learning about all the masters and all that kind of stuff and, and, and nailing your technique that way. But the only way you're ever going to become a photographer that people want to pay your, for your pictures is by taking lots of them. My recommendation if you want to be a photographer is be a photographer. Go out and take loads of photographs, make as many mistakes as you can now so that you don't make them when you're being paid for it. The one thing I'll say, did I mention that it was earlier? Or was this year? Was talking no, you mentioned it. Yeah. I have mentioned yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. They're hell on earth. Okay. Yeah. So make your mistakes now. If you go to a wedding, take as many pictures as you can and you'll learn how to get, take good wedding photography so that next time you're there, if you ever get paid for it, you won't make those mistakes. Yeah. And the same thing goes for anything else. Take a thousand pictures of sunsets because when you've taken a thousand pictures, you've made every mistake you can, and when you've made all those, those mistakes, eventually you'll start taking good pictures. And then, when they're really good pictures, people will want to be there. Can we finish, Anthony? Very much work with Calgary nowadays, did not you? Something we covered off earlier. Yeah. I mean, well, you've got yeah. And you, you, I think a lot of people get caught up when it comes to photography. And like, I've got to have a good camera, and I've got to have this, I've got, I've got loads of outboard flashes, and loads of good lenses, and stuff. 
You haven't, because that equipment is only one small part of everything. Okay? Exposure, composition, subject, background. They're the most important things, and all of those things can be, can be covered off. Move your phone. Yeah. Once you've nailed all those techniques, then move on to more expensive cameras, because mm -hmm. then you start thinking, oh, actually, I could do with this to get that shot up the field or whatever, blah, blah, blah. Nail your composition, that okay. Yeah? Right, can I have a clap for Nigel, please? <laughs>